My name is Meryl Chertoff, and I'm the Executive Director of the Justice and Society Program at the Aspen Institute. The Justice and Society Program is one of the oldest programs of the Institute. We've been here in Aspen for almost 40 years. Uh, in addition to our summer seminar, we do programming on independent courts, the rule of law, uh, and our Inclusive America Project on constructive engagement of interfaith and religious tolerance. Uh, I have a number of people who are here today that I want to thank. First of all, uh, thanks to the sponsors of this first Sandra Day O'Connor conversation, Shook, Hardy, and Bacon, Garfield and Hecht, Gibson, Dunn, and Crutcher, Boyd and Gray and Associates, the Lock, Lord form, uh, the Lock Lord Firm, and uh, Annie and Jerry Hosier. Uh, I also want to thank our Justice Circle. Uh, our two co-chairs are both here with us this afternoon, Tristan Duncan, thank you very much, and Sharon Owsley. Uh, we have with us today our wonderful Justice and Society seminar participants. We are having a really terrific week here in Aspen. Um, and I want to thank our moderators, uh, Judge Brett Kavanaugh, uh, and Robert Post, the Dean of Yale Law School until two days ago. Um, and um, I also want to thank um, our partner uh, in tonight's event, uh, iCivics. iCivics is the interactive online civics curriculum that Justice O'Connor founded. Um, and uh, it was first known as Our Courts. Uh, and we have today, we're joined by five high school students, two national O'Connor scholars, uh, and three scholars in the Roaring Fork Valley. So Shosho Leho, Bennett Phillips, Chloe Bretman, Matthew Popish, and Francesca Seaman, would you just rise for a moment, please? So this is the very first Sandra Day O'Connor conversation, and uh, this is an inaugural event. This is part of a four-year series. Um, I am really excited to be able to announce our second speaker. Um, for next year, please mark your calendars for July 10th, 2018, when Evan Thomas, known to many of you as a biographer, uh, who is working on a biography of Sandra Day O'Connor, will be our second Sandra Day O'Connor speaker. Uh, I want to extend greetings to uh, the audience that is listening on Aspen NPR uh, and also the overflow crowd in the Pepke Auditorium. Uh, we have a sold out, uh, uh, sold out theater tonight and also additional people both uh, at home and over in Pepke. Uh, Justice O'Connor couldn't join us this evening for health reasons. She's represented this evening by her son, Brian O'Connor, and his wife, Sean, and we want to thank them very much for being here. Um, point of personal privilege. Um, I've worked with Justice O'Connor since 2005 when uh, I worked on a project called the Sandra Day O'Connor Project at Georgetown Law School. She has been, both on and off the court, a guardian of the institutional protections of democracy, notably federalism. In her jurisprudence, she took most seriously the power of the states to resist tyranny when it comes in the form of the federal government. That did not always make her popular, but as we now learn, it was profoundly wise. She has championed the independence of the judiciary. Many people took that as a given, but as we now see, she has been profoundly wise. And through her advocacy for civics education, to show young people that democracy is in their own hands and must be guarded through knowledge and education, she saw directly to our current predicament. As Justice O'Connor has said, as a citizen, you, learn, you need to learn how to be part of it, how to express yourself, and not just by voting. Only a year ago, in our Justice and Society seminar classroom, there was a lively debate between a young feminist attorney who claimed that we were in the last inch of the struggle for gender equality and that women should turn to questions of intersectionality. An older woman rose to say that the gains of gender equality remain tender and that what has been won also can be lost. 
What stands between us and tyranny very often is only the judiciary. Justice Kagan, like Justice O'Connor, has focused on guarding our freedoms, our autonomy, and the institutions of a free society. She brings to the Supreme Court the wisdom of a scholar, the tact of a law school dean, and the wit of the New York City girl that she was. Justice McGregor was Justice O'Connor's first Supreme Court law clerk. She practiced law in many, for many years in Arizona at the Fenimore firm before she was appointed to the bench. She served on the Arizona Supreme Court as its chief justice. She continues to advocate for judicial independence and to teach. I'm delighted that she and her husband, Bob, both participated in the Justice and Society Seminar a couple of years ago. And with that, let me welcome to the podium Justice Ruth McGregor. Good evening, and thank you, Meryl. On July 7th, 1981, I was in my car driving to work at a Phoenix law firm where I was a relatively recent partner. Just a few days earlier, our lawyers and their spouses, including my partner John O'Connor and his wife Sandra, had returned from a firm outing to Prescott, Arizona, which has the oldest rodeo on the 4th of July. Of course aware of the rumors that then Judge O'Connor was being considered for the Supreme Court, we asked her some questions. As you would expect, she was dismissive of the rumors and quickly turned any conversation to another topic. So as I drove that morning, I turned on the news just in time to hear President Reagan say, she is truly a person for all seasons. I had missed the first part of his remarks, and I had not heard him say who she was. And during the rest of his remarks, he did not repeat the name. <laughs> Only when I, of course, was pounding my steering wheel and asking, who is it, who is it? Only when a reporter began speaking did I know that she was Sandra Day O'Connor. I reacted the way many women lawyers did, with great emotion. We hoped that the world for women in law had changed that day, and it had. Justice O'Connor's impact on women's opportunities began immediately. First, we immediately felt new energy and confidence that we could accomplish what we wanted. And also, she immediately disproved the notion that women could not handle the more demanding areas of legal practice. Because if a woman can handle being a Supreme Court justice, what areas should remain off limits to female women lawyers? And in addition, she was outspoken in educating those who would deny women opportunity. And she spoke not only to those in power, but those affected. Thousands of young women, many of us not so young anymore, tell moving stories of the difference she made when she spoke with them at their elementary or high school, at their law school, at their law firm, at bar meetings, and at events that she organized at the United States Supreme Court. She also used her position and her influence to further other objectives important to her view of the essential nature of a judicial system that assures continued adherence to the rule of law. Explaining that judicial independence is the essential underpinning of our democratic government, she cautioned that such independence is tremendously hard to create and easier than most people imagine to damage or destroy. So working with organizations, local, national, and international, she spoke with leaders and judges and lawyers in numerous countries to help them reach their goal of forming an independent judiciary. Her work to further judicial independence and reliance on the rule of law led her to the realization that in this country, too few of our students and too few of our adults understand our government, our history, and our laws. Alarmed and frustrated by the lack of civic education available to middle and high school students, Justice O'Connor began a project now known nationally as iCivics to teach students about our government. The Aspen Institute Justice and Society program has brought together all of these important strands of Justice O'Connor's legacy 
through the Sandra Day O'Connor conversations, and I am delighted to introduce the first of them. I begin by returning to the difference Justice O'Connor made for women in law by noting that in 1981, this conversation would not have been possible. If we had looked in 1981 for a woman who had served as a state Supreme Court Chief Justice, our task would not have been impossible, but it would have been difficult since only four women had ever held that position. Fortunately, those things changed. Our interlocutory, our, our interlocutory this evening, retired Massachusetts Chief Justice Margaret Marshall, spent 16 years in private practice and four years as general counsel to Harvard University before joining the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court in 1996 as only the second woman to serve on that court. She became its first female Chief Justice in 1999 and served in that capacity until 2010. Her commitment to equality and justice, honed as she worked to end minority rule in her home country of South Africa, became a hallmark of her service to the court. And in 1981, it would have been not just difficult, but impossible to hear from a woman who served not only as the first female dean of the Harvard Law School, but also as the first woman to serve as Solicitor General. We can do so today because we are joined by Justice Elena Kagan, the fourth woman to serve on the United States Supreme Court. Justice Kagan established a distinguished career in public service and academia before being confirmed as Solicitor General in 2009 and, as you know, in 2010 as Associate Justice on the United States Supreme Court. She continues the practice, not initiated but much expanded by Justice O'Connor, of speaking publicly to explain the important role of the court and of the rule of law. These two women embody the traits Justice O'Connor has worked all her life to promote. They fiercely support judicial independence and the rule of law. They promote civic knowledge and engagement, and they serve as role models and mentors to young students. We are fortunate to have them with us Please join me in welcoming Justice Elena Kagan and Chief Justice Margaret Marshall. Justice Kagan, I have to say, just listening first to Merrill and then to Ruth McGregor talk about Justice O'Connor, it reminds me um, just how far we've come and in what shorter period of time in a way, and how thrilled I am to have you seated here because and I think if we look forward, you have clearly been a glass ceiling breaker a concrete ceiling breaker, whatever it was. I sometimes told, tell Justice Kagan that she's shorter than I am, because she was only knocking her head against concrete ceilings. I'm, I, mine were only glass. Um, let me begin by simply saying, what's your view of Justice O'Connor anyway, anytime, any place? Yeah. Um, well, thank you for asking me that question because I have lots to say about Justice O'Connor. Great. <laughs> All uh, very laudatory. Um, uh, but first, let me, let me thank uh, the Aspen Institute for invi inviting me here and to Merrill Chertoff in particular for inviting me here. And it, it really is my honor uh, to be here to uh, honor Justice O'Connor at this inaugural uh, lecture named for her. Um, uh, she... Everybody knows that uh, she is one of the most important Supreme Court justices. She was also every, uh, one of the greatest Supreme Court justices. And people, ju judges can be great for diff different reasons in different ways. I, I think for Justice O'Connor, uh, she was great because she did more good for this country uh, than pretty much anybody 
in modern memory at least, who has served on the Supreme Court. I mean, if you think about this, uh, this is a little bit of a thought experiment, but suppose you were creating a constitution and somebody said, here's an idea. We're, we're going to take all the really hot button important issues in a society and we're going to make sure that they all go to the Supreme Court. And then, we're going, the court's going to have nine people in it, but really for several decades, only one person is going to make all the decisions. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody will be talking to that person, they'll be writing briefs to that person, they'll be uh, give, delivering their oral arguments to that person because they all know that she's going to be the decision maker. Now, if you were in a constitutional convention and somebody said that to you, you would think that is ridiculous. You can't do that. You know, why, why that one person? Who, who was she or who was he? Um, and the answer, though, is if it was Justice O'Connor, it would all turn out all right. <laughs> <laughs> and I can think of precious few people whom you can say that about that in case after case, issue after issue, the most important issues of the day, the, the hottest issues of the day, the most divisive issues of the day, uh, that because of circumstances, Justice O'Connor very, very often, almost always, cast the deciding vote, and she did so in a way that demonstrated extraordinary wisdom, that understood something about this nation, about the people who inhabit it, about what they would and would not stand for, about what their best values were. Uh, and she did this over and over and over again. And uh, really, we are such a better nation because of that, because of her decisions and, and, uh, and her votes. And there's a, there was a kind of practical wisdom that I think has uh, almost never been seen on the Supreme Court that she had. And uh, this nation had the very good fortune that for several decades, a person of that kind of practical wisdom uh, actually made, uh, uh, the, uh, actually decided a lot of the most important Supreme Court cases. Now, I also, uh, I mean, but what's striking about Justice O'Connor as well is that after she retired, you know, most justices when they retire, uh, they putter around a little I think bit. Any justices retire? Yeah, they? some of them no, but <laughs> occasionally, you know, they putter around. They go make a few speeches. One of the most remarkable things about Justice O'Connor, I think, is that she had this whole second chapter after she retired, and the I Civics program that she helped to design and that she led for uh, quite some number of years now, has done remarkable things in terms of teaching students across the country about our system of government in ways that make, them, make it all seem like fun. And, uh, and, and this curriculum that she's developed, I think, has been uh, a great educational change. So, uh, so she's had these two remarkable periods of achievement and accomplishment. Now, I, I have to say that maybe part of the reason for that is that Justice O'Connor is a woman who liked to get her way, likes to get her way. So I'll just tell uh, uh, one personal story about that. And it goes back to when I was a very young lawyer I was a couple of years after I graduated from law school and I had the good fortune to clerk on the Supreme Court. And Justice O'Connor had been there for several years already. I clerked for Justice Marshall. And uh, clerks get to know some of the justices a little bit, conversations around the building, an occasional lunch or two. I got to know Justice O'Connor in that way. And Justice O'Connor at the time, and I think throughout her tenure on the court, had an aerobics class, you know, like 1980s style aerobics. <laughs> and um, one of the things that Justice O'Connor liked was that she thought that all the women clerks should come to her aerobics <laughs> class. And there weren't too many of us then. Uh, I think there were only seven of us at the time. 
and she thought uh, a good turnout would be seven. <laughs> now, at, at the time, I fancied myself kind of an athlete. And I thought, you know, aerobics, that was not like real exercise, that was not sport. And there's also, as some of you may know, uh, a basketball court at the Supreme Court, and there are several times weekly, some of the clerks and other uh, members of the, the court staff go up and play basketball. And I thought basketball was more my style. So I went and I played basketball. Now, the basketball court at the court, until a few years ago, was basically, um, uh, the floor was basically concrete. And this meant that really you couldn't play on it for an entire year without seriously injuring yourself. <laughs> and uh, one day, it was my turn. And uh, I tore some kind of ligament or tendon or something like that. And I was uh, hobbling around. I was on crutches for several weeks. One day, uh, I was at the court and I was walking down the hall with my crutches, making my way very slowly. And Justice O'Connor was coming the other way. And uh, she stopped and she said, uh, what, what happened? And I said, you know, I, I, I tore a tendon playing basketball. And she looked at me and she shook her head very slowly and she said, it wouldn't have happened in aerobics class. <laughs> So that's my Justice O'Connor story. <laughs> but uh, I, I, I love Justice O'Connor, and so it's a real privilege to be here. Thank you so much. I, it's at the end. <laughs> Can we just keep... You want me to say a few more words? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but as you were telling that wonderful story, I thought Justice O'Connor liked to get away, but uh, one of my guests here today likes to get away as well, and she was on the basketball uh, court and not playing aerobics. But let me go back just to touch on the second part of her career, which both Mel and um, Ruth have touched on. As you heard from uh, Ruth, I come from South Africa, which didn't have an independent judiciary, and so I've really um, loved watching Justice O'Connor. And I want to read, if I can, just a short little piece that she said, and in addition to the other wonderful quotes, and then I'm going to ask you uh, how you got your own civic education. Um, this is a quote from Justice O'Connor, which she's used many times. The better educated our citizens are, the better equipped they are, will be to preserve the system of government we have. Knowledge about our government is not handed down through the gene pool. Every generation has to learn it, and we have some work to do. And I want to emphasize that when she's talking about our government, she's really talking about the structure, the function, I mean, these three branches of government, which do sometimes express themselves with nine justices and everybody deciding the hot button issues is one. Where did you learn your civics education? I mean, where did Elena Kagan come from? Because we haven't been teaching civics for a long time in our public schools or anywhere else. I know your mother was a teacher. Your two brothers are teachers. I don't know why you're not a teacher, but I think you are a teacher. Uh, where did you sort of figure out how this fabulous system of government works? Yeah, well, I, I was very lucky, and there are lots of kids out there that are nowhere near as lucky as I was. Um, my, my, uh, my parents were educated people. My parents were very involved in their community and in civic activities. Uh, and I went to great schools. And so when all those things happen, uh, you know, it's easy to, to pick up uh, things about how the government works. Um, but, but not all kids are that lucky. And I think that the, the, you know, you look at some of the polls that are done, every year it seems another poll comes out and, it, and asking about what people know about the American system of government. Sometimes you know they'll, they'll read the First Amendment and they'll say, "Do you agree with that?" And everybody says, "No." <laughs> and uh, you know they'll they'll ask just you know about basic things about uh, about our structure of government, about the institutions, the presidency, Congress, the courts. And it's always pretty shocking to me. Um, uh, so you know I think what Justice O'Connor recognized was that schools had to do a much better job 
of this. Um, uh, and, uh, and, you know, that's what she has done since she's retired from the court. So let me just ask you a little bit more, push that. She has been mostly talking to her high school students and, and elementary school students, but I am astounded at how many, frankly, lawyers don't really understand the difference between a constitutional democracy of the kind that you just described. Should law schools be doing more? Should universities be doing more? Well, I hope that people coming out of law schools. No, uh, let me tell you, they don't. They don't all. Okay. I mean, last night we had a wonderful panel here and Mickey Edwards, the former congressman said, our colleges and universities don't teach a thing about civics and democracy. And he was emphasizing our colleges and universities. I'm just talking about the basic structure. Right. They may know about Marbury against Madison, you know, the great court that said you are the final deciders. Yeah. But it seems to me we still have an awful lot to do. Well, uh, you know, I, I, I think if you haven't done this by the time you go to college, it's, it's, it's very possible that it will never happen. So I'm a big proponent of doing it early. I know, uh, you're you know, first grade, second saying grade, we do, we're not grade. Do, we're not doing it in our public schools. I mean, it's wonderful that she has iCivics, but we just don't teach civics anymore. I mean, we just don't. Do your brothers teach civics? Yeah, my brothers are both social studies teachers. I know, do they so teach so civics? I think that, uh, they probably do. They <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have them here next year and examine them to find out how much they... And I have some really dandy <laughs> questions for them. And okay, you, you I, will I, be think, I think you have a new job, Justice Marshall. I do, I do. <laughs> <laughs> and it's getting you back onto this panel to make my life look so much easier. So Justice O'Connor, um, you heard uh, Ruth talk about how she heard the news. Um, I wonder how many people here know that Justice O'Connor's confirmation hearings before the Senate were the first to be televised in our nation's history, right? I mean, if you want to be a first, I mean, you heard how she was quiet and so on. First, where were you when you heard of her appointment? Gosh, you know, I, I, I don't remember where I was at that moment, but, uh, I, but I, com I completely agree with Justice McGregor about how important Justice O'Connor was for lawyers of my generation, women lawyers, and also uh, men lawyers of my generation um, in terms of the path that she uh, uh, set. And when it came time for my confirmation hearing, you know, you uh, get up in front of the cameras and you're allowed to speak for five minutes and to thank the people who ought to be thanked. And two of the people whom I thanked were Justice O'Connor and Justice Ginsburg, because that generation of women lawyers um, and Justice Marshall, uh, 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 you know, made all the difference in the world uh, to, to, the, to people one generation on. Um, uh, you know, Justice McGregor said of me that I was the first this and the first that. And I guess technically speaking, that's true, but it was more a matter of fluke than anything else. There were, <laughs> there were women deans of premier law schools before me, and there, were, there was a woman attorney general before there was a woman solicitor general. And, you know, women had already uh, cracked that ceiling, not as much as you would wish, but... Uh, but it had already happened, and it, it, and it happened because of people like Justice O'Connor and Justice Ginsburg, who graduated at this time, I mean, it's such remarkable stories. They graduated first in their class, and basically nobody wanted to hire them, and they had to make their careers up from scratch. They kind of had to figure out how to create uh, uh, these brilliant careers even when the institutions of the legal profession were saying, no, we're, we're really not ready for women. And, uh, and in, in doing that, uh, those two women, women made such an incredible difference for, you, you know, if you sort of think about the four Supreme Court justices, it's uh, Justice O'Connor and Justice Ginsburg, and then 25 years on, it's uh, me and Justice Sotomayor. And Justice Sotomayor and I would not have been possible except for Justice O'Connor and Justice Ginsburg. Well, I'll accept that, but I will not accept that it was a fluke. <laughs> I just won't, <laughs> it was no fluke. But let me ask you, you, were, you, were, you clerked for uh, uh, Justice Thurgood Marshall, the first African American. Justice O'Connor was on the court, even if you didn't join her aerobics class. 
What, what did you learn about how they, in their role as justices, approached their work? What, what perspectives did they bring? I don't mean in a particular case, but how did you see that they went around their work? Yeah, well, uh, Justice O'Connor, I've always uh, already spoken of about sure. what I think <coughs> makes her so important. And, and, uh, and I can't really add anything in terms of what I saw on the court, sure. because chambers do function a little bit as you know, nine separate law offices, and, and so I wasn't privy to the conversations with her about how she decided cases and so forth. Um, but it was one of the great honors of my life to have spent that year clerking for Justice Marshall and to have that opportunity to sit with him and talk about cases and to talk about anything else he wanted to talk about, and, and often he did. Uh, <laughs> Do you have any stories that you can share with you, us? You, you know, the stories about Justice Marshall were so legion. The question is uh, where to start. That he was, uh, in my view, the greatest storyteller I've, uh, I've ever met. Uh, he was you know, just a raconteur. And we would come in and we would talk about cases. And, um, uh, and, and th those were serious conversations. I guess the thing that I most really... Uh, learned about Justice Marshall, the lawyer, was this, and I try to apply it every day, was is, uh, uh, that he had the knack of seeing straight to the heart of what most mattered in the case. You know, a lot of our cases, they're very complicated, they're very complex. You can ask a thousand zillion questions dealing with various facets of them. Um, but often the thing you want to do when you decide a case, the thing maybe you want to do at argument in a case, is to really ask the single question that kind of goes to the heart of the matter and once you know the answer to that, everything else falls into place. And, uh, and I thought that Justice Marshall had that, uh, you know, I would call it a real lawyer, great lawyer's skill of, uh, of, 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 of seeing to the heart of, of something. Um, but of course, the, the, uh, I think the, the, the reason that we all felt really privileged to clerk for Justice Marshall was not just because he was a Supreme Court justice and he, w had, uh, and he had these great lawyerly skills that he brought to the bench, um, but because he had been this extraordinary lawyer. I mean, I think the greatest lawyer of the 20th century, bar none, uh, in part because of his skills and in part because of what he used them to do. If being a great lawyer is um, doing a lot of justice, there's nobody who did more justice than, um, than Thurgood Marshall did uh, uh, in that period of time and you know, maybe ever. And, uh, and, I th and, and he talked a lot about his life and about his work uh, for the Legal Defense Fund. And sitting there in his office and being uh, regaled with these mm -hmm. stories, uh, m many of which were extremely sad, tragic, horrible stories, and s somehow you were both crying and laughing at the same time because of the way he told them. But, uh, but it was, it, it was uh, you know, I'll always look back in that to, to that year and think, boy, I had the opportunity uh, to, to hear uh, from this really quite extraordinary great man in a way that very few people did. Uh, ab about his life, about the way he viewed the law, about the way he viewed the world. So uh, it, was, it, was, it was a real treat. Well, I think he taught his law clerk one wonderful thing, which is how to be a raconteur. So I don't know whether you've picked up the list, but, but you've certainly picked that up. I don't, I don't <laughs> hold a candle, I, I can assure you. Um, let me just say a little bit more about being, the f being a sort of first woman, first African American. We've had those first, and they are important, but there was a 25 year um, gap before this, the third and the fourth were appointed. And there's an awful lot of discussion going along, and I'm looking at our students here, where there's evidence that you can be the first, and in some ways I was the first, and then other things came more easily, but it's the third and the fourth and the fifth and the sixth, and we seem to get stuck. So when you are talking to people who haven't been at the very top, um, who haven't been the Solicitor General, who haven't been the Dean of the Harvard Law School, what advice do you give them that can give them the same kind of inspiration that Justice Marshall and Justice O'Connor gave to you? Well, I, I, I don't know that I have much advice about 
how to become Solicitor General <laughs> or how to become. Don, uh, Don. Yeah. We were uh, hoping for that would be an yeah. inside tip. So. Yeah, but I, 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 you know, be in the right place at the right time is I think sure. what, what, what I would say. But uh, I, I guess, yeah, I, when, I was, when I was Dean, whether I wanted to or not, I had to do a lot of advice giving to a lot of young lawyers. And, uh, and, and, and mostly what I told them was to sort of follow their own passions, to use law school and to use the early years of a legal career to find out what really mattered to them and what, uh, what made for uh, genuine meaning and fulfillment in their lives. And it's different things for different people. And to try to sort of uh, say, well, I'm just going down this channel because it's what all my friends are doing is, is the worst mistake you can make. But instead, to, to, to really use those years to, to find a job that when you wake up in the morning, you just can't wait to get to work because what you're doing uh, has real meaning and, and what you're doing you think matters. Matters, uh, uh, because I think you know, it's, it's in jobs that really matter that people find their own greatest personal fulfillment. And did you know where you were headed or did you sort of find your way there? Uh, I, I didn't at all know where I was headed. I, I, I did, I, my, my career path was lots of twists and turns and zigzags and one moment I thought I was on a path to do one thing and then it turned out I was on a path to do something completely different. I mean, if you had asked me, um, 18 months before I became a Supreme Court justice, if you, I was, you know, I, I was in my sixth year at Harvard Law School, and if you had said, "Well, what's the next thing?" I would have said, uh, "You know, the next thing I'm going to spend a few more years here, and then I'm going to uh, go be a university president someplace." And I, my view was I was going out of law entirely, and then all of a sudden uh, something happened, and I got this opportunity of a lifetime become Solicitor General, which really did a little bit come out of the blue and, and, uh, uh, and you know, all of a sudden I was a person who would naturally be considered to be a justice and, and that was wildly unexpected. So before you became the Solicitor General who is the lawyer for the United States, before the United States Supreme Court, had you ever argued before the court? Yeah, uh, I, I hadn't, and I'll do you one better, I hadn't argued before any appellate court. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so uh, here's like a little bit of a story. Uh, I, I, I had been contacted by some people in the Obama White House, and they had asked me whether I was interested in a particular job, and I won't say what the job is. I'll just tell you that it was not Solicitor General. And, uh, and I said, yes, I would be interested in that job. It was another very good job, uh, but not Solicitor General. Uh, and, and it was a job where I thought, well, it, you know, this is a job that kind of makes sense, that I have some of the experiences and skills to do quite well in this job. And then um, I was uh, pretty far along the way through the vetting process, you know, where everybody reads every word you've ever said and talks to everybody you've ever known since kindergarten. And <laughs> I was pretty far along, the way, uh, along, uh, along that process and I suddenly got a call and it said, well, we've uh, decided that uh, you're not going to get that job. We want to know if you want to be Solicitor General. And I kind of said, what? <laughs> and I really did say on, on the phone, I said, I've, I've never done a Supreme Court argument. I'm not the person you want or need, or you know, I'm not the right person uh, to be that job, to, to, to fill that role. And they said, no, we're really, you know, we've sort of thought about this a lot and we're really confident you can do this. And uh, so I had to think about it a little bit. Uh-oh. <laughs> and uh, so I said, you yeah, know, I'll call you back in a, in a day or two. And I hung up the phone, and it really was a little bit of a, gosh, I just don't know if I uh, am the right person for this. You know, I, I have a healthy self-regard, believe me. <laughs> but uh, but I, 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 I just didn't know whether, you, know, you, would, you just said it. You'd never done an argument <laughs> in an appellate court. I didn't realize it was no appellate court. Yeah. I, was, I was giving you a way out. <laughs> but th then that self-regard took over again, and, and uh, I called them back, and I said, yes, 
Uh, and so that's what I found myself doing. I couldn't have done it except that the Solicitor General's office is such a remarkable place. Yeah. This is the office, can anybody hear anything that I'm saying? <laughs> Uh, th this is the office that uh, does all the appellate litigation for the United States. So in all the appellate courts, and particularly in the Supreme Court. And it's, uh, it's staffed with these fantastic appellate lawyers who stay the same from administration to administration to administration. There are only two people that the president appoints to uh, the S Solicitor General's office, all the rest are people who are there regardless of party or of administration. And they're remarkable lawyers and they were incredibly generous people. And they basically, you know, taught me. They taught me everything I know, whatever that is. <laughs> and do you remember your first argument? Did you start off with some of the intermediate appellate courts that just slide out over there or did you just go straight for the big? Yeah, well, I, I didn't actually have that opportunity. Uh, my first argument was a special session of the Supreme Court. They call it a special session just so I could do my first case, which was a, a re-argument of Citizens United. Oh. So, uh, so you know, Citizens United sounds as though you know it, which is uh, all about campaign finance regulation. And it had been thought of as a kind of small case when it had been argued by one of the deputy solicitors general. And then the court decided that it actually it wanted to reconsider some of the precedents on which the case was based. And so an order came out saying, well, we want this re-argued in a special session of the court happening in September when the term really starts in October. And uh, uh, the lawyers are instructed to brief the following questions those questions being whether to overturn uh, very significant campaign finance uh, decisions of the court. Now, um, you can imagine that this was a little bit petrifying. Oh, not at all, not yeah. at all. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah I, I very much felt, my gosh, this is my first argument and it's such a big deal, it's such a big issue and sort of the eyes of the world are uh, on me and I better not mess it up. The one thing that, uh, that I said to myself, and I think it was right, was, you know, in the end, probably your argument is not going to make the difference, <laughs> is that when the court does something like that, yeah, there's a pretty good sense uh, on the court's part that it knows what it wants to do, um, that it's, you know, giving everybody an opportunity to brief questions that they didn't have before, but that probably uh, there were five justices who were ready to overturn these cases and to uh, 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 issue this decision. So, um, so I hope I didn't lose the case. You know, I, d I don't think I did. But it was, it was, uh, was, it was a pretty petrifying experience. It I'll tell you one ar uh, story from from that uh, argument. Argument, and. So my heart is beating really hard. I mean, literally, it's the only time in my life where I n have known what that expression means. I practically couldn't hear anything because of the pounding that was happening inside my own body. And uh, I thought, my God, how am I going to do this? And uh, I got up to the podium and I had memorized, as people do, uh, three or four or five sentences to start with. And at the end of the first sentence, which frankly I hadn't really thought was the key sentence, it was, <laughs> it sort of seemed to me a fairly undisputed anodyne kind of sentence. At the end of the first sentence, Justice Scalia leaned over the bench um, in this way that I grew to know that he has. Le uh, leaned, leaned over, the, I had just said something. I, I had made a short declarative sentiment, sentence and he said, wait. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> <laughs> Except he said it even more strongly than that. Uh, and then he proceeded to tell me why this single sentence was wrong. But it was the best, it was the absolute best thing that anybody could have done. Because it just forced me to be in the game right away. And my own view is that he knew that. Absolutely. That he knew, you know, from the sound of my voice saying that single sentence, that I was a little bit shaky. And he was just going to put me into the game right away. And if somebody challenges you, you have to stand right back and, uh, and, 
And that's what happened, and it turned out fine. <laughs> I, want, I told the story uh, uh, once before, maybe even a couple of times before, and uh, I had remembered it in my head as Justice Scalia leading forward on the bench and saying, no, no, <laughs> no, no. It was really the way I had remembered it. And uh, then one of, uh, one of the reporters who, uh, who saw that speech that I gave said, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't four no's, it was four weights. So. <laughs> Well, I hope from that maybe you could learn from another great law teacher, which is when you say wait, everybody hears no. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that was, you, you, you said that there was an expectation that five justices were at least preliminarily prefer, uh, prepared to overrule some of the leading precedents. We've just completed a year on the court. The court runs from October to June. Uh, where there were only eight justices. Um, can you talk a little bit about what that experience was like? Because the court did not stop issuing opinions. There were opinions that issued throughout the year. Uh, there were a couple that there was a sort of tea leaf uh, reading that maybe they had been held. But you know, the year went on and on and on and on. And it's not that easy to confirm, a, to nominate and confirm another justice to the court. Um, and so there seemed to be, I don't want to say more consensus, but I mean, you had to make, you had to reach a decision with eight justices, a rather unusually long period of time. What, if anything, can you tell us about that? Not so much about the particular cases, but the, the sort of w why that was a different time. Right, right. Well, uh, we, we went the better part of two terms of uh, course, with, yes. with, oh. eight, with, with eight justices because Justice Scalia passed away uh, in the middle of two terms two, ago. 2016. But, but, but before most of our cases had been decided or issued. Um, and, then, uh, and then most of this year, uh, this past year, uh, also with eight until Justice Gorsuch got confirmed and, and, and sat in the last month of the term. So for the better part of two terms, we had to do exactly what you're saying, was, uh, which is make decisions with eight people. And you know, there is a reason why appellate courts do not have even numbers of members. Uh, and it's because when you have an even number of members, uh, every case can end in a tie. And then you're not doing the job that you're supposed to be doing, which is actually deciding cases and uh, deciding important cases and resolving divisions among uh, lower appellate courts and so forth. Um, but that said, I think that the two-year period had uh, one silver lining. I mean, nobody would want to do it forever, but I think that there was something that we learned during that two-year period, which uh, I'm hopeful will have a lasting effect. Uh, and, and, and that's this. I mean, as you say, we did keep issuing decisions. That was because all of us were committed to trying to issue decisions, that we didn't want to look as though we couldn't do our job. Um, uh, and I think that was right across the board, that people th said yeah, every 4-4 decision where we just throw up our hands and say we affirm the decision below, every 4-4 decision is a failure on the part of this court. And so we worked very, very hard mm -hmm. to reach consensus and to, uh, to find ways to agree that might not have been very obvious. And, uh, you know, sometimes they'd led to a kind of silliness. Sometimes the way, w the thing we found to agree on was something that really nobody cared about. <laughs> but often, uh, I thought that the process was very good in terms of uh, finding, you know, ways to massage issues, modify issues in such a way that all of a sudden we could see the prospect of a broader consensus than might have appeared on first glance. And, uh, you know, I think that that was a good thing for us to learn. Uh, uh, the Chief Justice has said from the very beginning of his tenure that he cares a lot about uh, uh, achieving as wide a consensus in our decision making uh, as, as, uh, as we can. And I think that even before these two terms, we do that much more often than people 
give us credit for. About half of our cases are decided unanimously. Um, another significant um, set are, are decided with only one or two dissenting votes. But still, I think, uh, we, we uh, managed to find consensus in places during these last two years that we might not have expected to find, you know, out of necessity. And because of some uh, really great leadership skills uh, of the Chief Justice. And, uh, and, you know, I hope we remember that and I hope we continue to, to sort of go the extra mile to see if we can uh, uh, find ways to build bridges across seeming differences and to uh, develop more consensus than you think might exist. Well, it's <coughs> Justice Kagan, I'm going to, with great difficulty, have to turn my back on you because I'm going to ask the audience if there are questions and maybe while we're coming up with questions, um, I'll just ask you one other um, quick question. It's a very serious question, but we've talked a lot about the independent judiciary and I know that Justice O'Connor has become increasingly outspoken about um, threats that she sees to our constitutional democracy. Primarily, I think, not because of attacks on particular criticisms of Supreme Court decisions, but the kind of conversation that seems to me to suggest that the Supreme Court, unlike the other two branches, is somehow beholden to the popular will, you know, the majority of people. Do you have any observations from sitting on the court? I mean, are you aware of, of the sort of increasing concerns? Well, I think we tune a lot out um, uh, because... You have to. Because you have to, right? I think you know this. Um, and I think it's, 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 it's really important not to say this in a way that suggests that the judiciary shouldn't be criticized. Absolutely not. Because the judiciary in our system of government, government is doing awfully important things. And... Uh, and uh, you know, any given decision, some people may support and other people may oppose, and both sides have a have a have a right to say their piece. Um, and so, it's I think it's 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 quite important that talk about this not suggest that somehow we are immune from criticism and anything we everything we do is perfect. Uh, but at the same time, I think uh, certainly other actors in the uh, in, in the system of government. Uh, federal, state, uh, presidents and governors, members of legislators, uh, they too can criticize, but you hope that they respect the judiciary's important role in the system. You said at the very beginning of our conversation, we're not a pure democracy, we're a constitutional democracy. And and uh, that means that the judiciary has an important role to play in policing the boundaries of all the other branches. And that can make the judiciary uh, an unpopular uh, set of, of, uh, uh, of people when they say to a governor or a president or uh, Congress, no, you, you, you can't do that uh, because it's just not within your constitutional powers uh, or because it infringes on an individual's right. Um, and, uh, you know, again, th those decisions also can be criticized, but uh, you, you hope that, that uh, and I think it's been one of the great glories of this American constitutional democracy, is that uh, for you know, the great, great, great majority of time, however, however uh, uh, unhappy other governmental actors were with the court and the court's decision, they understood that that was the court's role and they respected the court's judgments. And, and, and that's what you uh, hope ha uh, happens in the future as well. And if I may just add a coda to that, the fact that uh, the other branches of government and our people accept the decisions of the United States Supreme Court is a remarkable achievement of the past several hundred years. It wasn't always that way and it probably always won't be that way. And there are many countries around the world who've tried to copy our model with their own adjustments, but where it is not so obvious that when the court rules, 
it will automatically be obeyed. Yes. So I think that is, that is, from my point of view, one of the great pleasures. Now, here, here. the first question I know is going to go to one of our young scholars, and then for other people, please put up your hands if you would like to ask Justice Kagan a question, because there are mics and somebody will find you. Yes. As a justice of the Supreme Court, you are responsible for upholding a constitution that was written over 230 years ago. How do you honor your oath to uphold that very constitution while acknowledging societal change? And how might that responsibility come into conflict with your personal beliefs? Well, that's a big, deep question. <laughs> <laughs> She, she is, after all, one of five scholars selected from across the country to be here, so <laughs> more power to you. <laughs> Can we go to one of the adults now? <laughs> oh, <laughs> let me tell you, I'm waiting. They're so shocked, nobody's putting their hand up. <laughs> um, so I think one of the most important things for any judge, whether it's a Supreme Court justice, whether it's a trial judge, anybody, uh, is to understand that your personal beliefs are not what matters. The law matters. Now, I'm going to talk about, sometimes it's hard to figure out what exactly the law is demanding, but it's the law that matters. And your policy beliefs, your personal beliefs, you have to put those aside. You have to put them in a box. Um, uh, because when you're interpreting a statute, it might not be the statute that you would have written, too bad. When you're interpreting the Constitution, it might not be the Constitution you would have written. Too bad. It's the Constitution that we have, and your oath of office, and your uh, responsibility to the American people is to do your best to interpret and apply the law that we have, the statutes that Congress passes, the Constitution that was ratified, as you say, more than 200 years ago. Now sometimes that is a hard job. Your personal beliefs can be in that box. And it's, it's just a hard job on which people will disagree as to how the Constitution ought to be interpreted, what it means with respect to any given situation. Uh, and as you say, uh, that job, you know, part of the reason that job is hard is because of the passage of time that you're talking about. But part of the reason that job is hard is because the drafters of the Constitution actually knew that that passage of time would happen. They wanted this Constitution to stick around for a long time. And, and because they knew that, they wrote it not to be very specific. There are all these phrases in the Constitution which uh, are not self-defining which you know, they don't tell you exactly what that means for any particular case. So if I say to you, and I'm going to use an example not from 1789, but from 1868, which is when the 14th Amendment was passed, which is the source of an enormous body of uh, current constitutional law. If I say to you, well the Constitution says that everyone's entitled to due process of law or to equal protection of the laws, now you have to tell me what that means. I mean, the dictionary just doesn't tell you that. And so you have to develop ways of, uh, of, of deciding what it means to, uh, uh, make sh to ensure that every, every citizen in our country has the equal protection of the law. Now, different justices have different views about how to do that. And I'm not going to use this to push my own view. My, uh, 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 you know, some justices say you, you really do have to look back and see whatever you can see about that moment when that amendment was ratified. I don't agree with that. I think that constitutional interpretation is more of an organic process. The way you understand and apply those provisions is by looking not only to what they meant at that moment in time, but throughout the stream of American history up through our own moment and particularly looking at what the court has said about those provisions year after year after year after year. I think that that's what produces the decisions that are most faithful to the Constitution and that fit best in our current world. 
So that's how I do constitutional interpretation. Others do it differently. But we're all struggling with the same problem, which is every single one of us on the court, I have absolutely no doubt, are putting our personal views into that box as far as we possibly can. We do have different views about interpretation, about uh, 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 especially as to the Constitution, um, uh, in some ways as to statutes as well. And those differences account for divisions on the court as to various important issues. Um, but, uh, but, 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 but that's what we're, all of us, every single one of us is doing law uh, rather than applying their own personal preferences in, in the way that they think uh, makes best sense. Any other questions? Yes. Thank you. Uh, first, I would like to say I'm a retired high school teacher, and I know that I am not smarter than a high school student, and I would like to congratulate them on their achievement because it's really wonderful. <laughs> Thank you for saying that. I should have said that, but I was so flummoxed by that <laughs> question. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Thank you for your presentation, Justice Kagan. And you made a comment about each justice chamber is like a separate law office. And so my question is, I was curious as to the process, as to how much time you spend working on your own and how much time you spend debating with each other and discussing before you come to your decisions. Right. Well, um, b most of your time is spent on, on your own. I mean, if I could count up the hours I spend uh, sitting in my office just staring at my computer screen or talking with my own clerks, uh, it vastly outnumbers the hours that I spend talking with other justices. But of course, the time spent talking with other justices is where the decisions get made. Um, so then you just, you spend a lot of time basically implementing the decisions by writing the opinions that you're assigned and, and so forth. But the way we uh, decide cases, I mean, maybe I should just say a little bit about that, is we, um, we, we, when, we hear a couple of cases on, on you know, Monday comes and we hear a couple of cases. And uh, then uh, a couple of days later, we go into conference on those cases. So we've had some time to think about the arguments. We've also had some time, uh, if we want to, to reach out to uh, one or two of, of your colleagues and see what they're thinking. But for the most part, that doesn't happen all that much. Really, the first time we get together and talk about a case is at this conference a couple of days later. And, uh, and, and that's the thing I think that, you know, if you had asked me, well, what, do you, what, do you, uh, what surprised you about the court? I, I would say the thing that you never know as an outsider looking in, however close you are to the process, you just don't know what that conference sounds like. So now that I've been at that conference, um, I can tell you that uh, you would think it sounds pretty good, actually, I think. That the justices, they come in, they, uh, everybody is prepared, everybody is thoughtful, everybody uh, listens to each other. The way we work it is the Chief Justice always starts, and he'll say, uh, you know, remember this case was about X, Y, Z, and the issues that have to be addressed are A, B, C, and then he'll, uh, uh, give his own views as to those issues, and everybody realizes that they're preliminary views, but he'll say, you know, this is what I think, and so uh, I would vote to affirm or reverse or whatever it is. And then it goes ar around the table, uh, and there's a rule that nobody can speak twice before everybody speaks once, and it goes in seniority order from the Chief Justice to the uh, Senior Associate Justice and then around the table uh, uh, in seniority order. And until a couple of months ago, I was always the person who spoke last. <laughs> and I can tell you that as the person who speaks last, you definitely want this rule that nobody can speak twice before everybody <laughs> speaks once. <laughs> 
But you know, last is a great place to be, actually, and I've spent the last month sort of regretting that I don't speak last anymore. <laughs> Because last year, you know, get to anchor the conversation a little bit and hear what everybody has to say. So I hope Justice Gorsuch appreciates that 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 <laughs> position. Uh, but um, uh, and then more general conversation breaks out and people respond to each other. You know, uh, not infrequently, people will say, you know, I was thinking about it this way, but uh, some other justice said something that really has made me rethink. Uh, the case and, and, and uh, people's minds change or people find uh, alternatives that they didn't know existed by listening to other people. And so there's pretty uh, vigorous and I think, uh, y y you know, really valuable debate and discussion uh, at, th at that conference. And, but then eventually we have a vote and, uh, and, and uh, the senior justice in the majority, so that would be the chief justice if he's in the majority, and whoever the senior justice is if he's not, uh, assigns the opinion. Uh, and the, usually the senior justice in, in, in the dissent uh, assigns a dissent, although that's a little bit uh, uh, less strictly enforced. And, uh, and, and then you do, you go back to your office, and you do spend uh, a, a lot of time uh, staring at your computer and, 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 and trying to implement those decisions as best you can. Other questions? One more question. Well, if there's no question, uh, there, right over there, and while you're getting the mic there, uh, Justice Kagan, you, you may be interested to know the Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts does it the same way, except the Chief Justice speaks last, yes. which has all the advantages that you just said you've had for the last couple of years. Yeah. And so when we get our first woman Chief Justice of the United States, I'm hoping that she may try a slightly different model, because yeah. she may remember how nice it is to speak last. Well, I'll, t I'll tell you <laughs> something. I, would, uh, I think last is, is definitely better than eighth or seventh or sixth or fifth or what have you. But I think, uh, though, the one, I, the, the exception I would make is I think it's probably better to speak first. Oh. Because <laughs> if you speak first, you really do get wait, to sort of set, wait, the, wait, set the tone. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> <laughs> yes, over here. Justice Kagan, I want to ask uh, what advice you would have for young girls who have ambitions uh, similar to your own but face derailment along their path. For example, limited economics or lack of parental support or family obligations that seem insurmountable. How do you stick to your dream? Uh, yeah, so uh, you know, there are lots of girls and, and, and young women who are not nearly as lucky as I have been. And um, to, to, to stick to your dream when that's the case is, is they're, they're, they're doing something a whole lot harder than I've ever uh, had to do. But, you know, I think uh, uh, success is mostly based uh, on grit and determination uh, uh, for uh, girls and, and young women who, 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 who don't have great advantages. And the people who, who make it notwithstanding that and who, uh, uh, and, who, and who succeed despite all the really terrible things that life has thrown at them are the, uh, are, the, are, the, are, the, are the girls and the young women who just have a kind of stick to itiveness that nothing will ever beat them, I think. And, um, uh, 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 you know, there are some, some, uh, some, some people like that who have come from backgrounds like that on the current court, and uh, I'm unbelievably admiring of, uh, of, of what they've accomplished. You know, I, and you know, I'll just name names, the two people who are like that, who really just had just so much stuff thrown at them, are Justice Sotomayor and Justice Thomas. And, and, and their ability to, to, to rise above it all, you know, as I think, I think both of them found people in their lives, but I think mostly it's because uh, uh, they have the kind of like steely determination uh, and, 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 and grit that says, you know, I am not going to let life defeat me. And it's, it's an amazing thing to see. What a great thing. Thank you so much, Justice Kagan. <laughs>